Uh, so, hi everybody, my name is Matt Domko. Um, I don't know who that was, but they're my new best friend. Uh, so you are at Data On Demand, the challenges of building a privacy-focused AI device. And in reality, like what I want to talk about is uh, I am a consumer and also a supporter of the AI magical things. Um, and if, if I have the one that I work on at work or if I have one from somebody else, there are just certain things that I really want to make sure that they happen. Uh, and that's kind of the, the goal of this thing. Uh, so I do have a job. Uh, they pay me to do stuff. Um, these are my thoughts, things in my brain that I wrote down in order to make a device safer. Um, but this is not the thoughts and ideas of my company. Um, my company, a company I work at. Uh, so I'm into 3D printing, laser cutting, uh, cosplay, mostly steampunk stuff. Um, if you ever want to nerd out about any of that or just security education in general, I'm super, super into it. Uh, I'm also the director of fun at Tynes, if anybody's familiar with Tynes. Uh, it's an unofficial title and they don't pay me, but I, it's the director of fun. Uh, here's the agenda we'll work through. So the, the problem. There's all these things, and it's funny, when I was creating these slides, it was like, okay, what are the AI devices that exist? And there were like three. And then all of a sudden we had two new ones appear that are the exact same, but different with the same name. I don't know. Anyway, the point is, is I want a hardware device that makes AI easy for just the general consumer, but I want to respect their privacy because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of a challenge when you think about the difference between working in the consumer space where it's like anyone in my family who's not into technology might actually uh, purchase one of these versus the team that I work with at an organization and they already have an understanding of, of how they treat their data and where it's going. Uh, so before we get into the pipelines that we, uh, we should be using to protect those, uh, that data, uh, I want to start off talking about some basic request workflows. So when I think about doing something with any kind of AI, it's really four different types of requests. And there are two, of, it's basically two with a little differences. Uh, so the first one is just a general knowledge request. I don't need to know anything about you. I can just make this request. Uh, the second one is a contextual knowledge request. So I need to know some things about you, but I don't need any super sensitive data. Uh, generic actions requests. So if I want to do something for you, but it could be anybody, it could be done for Matt, it could be done for Steve, it could be done for Jay. I think that's who that was now. Um, uh, that's what we would do. But if I wanted to do something on behalf of you, on your Spotify account, on your Grubhub account, whatever it is, I need to be authenticated. And so that's that fourth type um, that I like to think about. So if we look at uh, the general knowledge request, it's, it's fairly simple. So I have my, my AI walkie talkie. I push the button and I say, whatever it is I'm gonna say, what, what's the weather out today? Um, it's gonna go up through the internet into my cloud provider. There's a routing and storage and replay engine that sort of glues everything together. But at its core, we're really just doing uh, speech to text, text to speech, uh, and some LLM calls to, to figure out what the right answer is. So that's a knowledge request. Uh, when we're doing those, those types of requests, right, what kind of data are we thinking about? Uh, well, if my request is tell me a, cat about, a fact about cats, super easy. Uh, if I say I've got a weird rash, uh, should I see a doctor? A uh, little bit more sensitive than tell me a fact about cats. And so when I think about protecting this data, uh, it's really three different kinds. I've got audio data, that recording of my voice that needs to get converted into speech to text. Uh, I've got the transcript data, which is the result of that speech to text call. And then I've got my response data, uh, which is where I took that, that text, uh, ran it through an LLM and had the, the LLM give me an answer. When we think about generic action requests, it's very, very similar to what we just saw. The only difference is now we insert an actuator. So an actuator is just a thing that can perform a task when you provide an input. Uh, and so this is, this is the thing that calls the Google Weather API for you. 
Uh, as far as the types of data that, that we need and that we need to protect, uh, we've still got our audio, transcript, and response data, but we also have some contextual data, right? Things like your location, things like your interests. If I ask about, if I ask, if I ask my AI walkie-talkie for uh, five restaurants in the area that are good, ideally, if I absolutely do not like cheeseburgers, it would not give me the greatest cheeseburger restaurant in the neighborhood because it knows. And so that contextual data is also something super sensitive that we want to protect. Uh, and the last piece uh, is the authenticated action request. Exact same flow as everything else. Uh, the only difference is now we have to store some sort of credential somewhere, right? I can't order you food from your Uber Eats account unless I have a way to tell Uber, hey, Matt wants food from Uber. So whenever I think about that, uh, more examples, call me an Uber, order me some tacos, did Jimmy do his homework? Um, same, old, same data as before, but we have additional context. We have the identity of the person that's asking for it. Uh, we have additional context about who this Jimmy person is, right? Some like fa familial connection. Um, and then authentication information. Uh, so this is like the sticky point that I feel like, uh, always, it's always a really fun discussion. Um, and so, so yeah, I don't want to just make authentication information, something tiny, uh, on the slide. I want to actually talk about it. So if I think about how can I authenticate, uh, a customer, well, or as a customer, sorry, uh, I can do one of three things really. I can save their username and password in a database, and then anytime I need to do something as them, I just log in as them. Um, that's cool, right? Probably not. Um, I can have them log in, and I can store their cookies, so at least I can't create a new session, I can only use that same session again. Uh, and then the last option is I can just use OAuth. The problem is, is as security professionals, it's really easy to just say, go be a grown up and use OAuth. But whenever you're, you're working with a business that has to make money, you, you actually have to think about these things and consider some of the trade-offs. So we're gonna talk about some of the trade-offs. Uh, so if I just store the username and password, it's great. We can log in whenever we want. Uh, sorry, yeah, wherever we want, whenever we want. Um, I don't actually have to store any session information because if, if I get logged out, I'll just log back in because I know their username and password. Um, downside, I have their username and password and someone can steal it. Uh, bonus, we can log in whenever we want. Uh, I covered that part already. Uh, and then the downside to that is in order to actually revoke our access, a customer has to change their password. Um, again, another bonus, we can do anything that the customer can do because we have their username and password. But the downside, we can do anything the customer can do, including change their password. Um, so if we're thinking about trade-offs, this one doesn't feel like the right thing to do. So the next thing we have, right, uh, session cookies. So lots of pros here, sessions expire regularly. Uh, the downside for the engineering team is sessions expire regularly. Um, I can have access to almost everything that a user can do. If you've ever tried to go in and um, add someone to a repository in GitHub, like you can create a repository, just I'm logged in, but in order to add a person to that repository, you have to step up, you have to type in your password again, you have to do an MFA push. Um, and so this is really great because if the provider supports it, we can actually scope down what it is that we're able to do. Um, but the downside is the provider actually has to support that. So while GitHub might have that requirement, um, the McDonald's mobile app maybe doesn't. Um, another nice thing on the engineering side um, is typically uh, MFA requirements, bot protection, all of that happens uh, at sign-in and before you actually get your session token for the site. Um, the downside is that it also doesn't usually generate a new login event. So if you're like me, and every time you get a message from Google that says, hey, you just logged in from somewhere new, was that you? And you get like super paranoid, um, you're not gonna get those because 
most providers just say, oh, you've got a session token that already works, so we're just going to use that. Um, so that's it's not great. Um, uh, a good thing, users can, can actually manually expire those sessions for themselves, which is great, right? Because if I go to Gmail and I say, where am I logged in? And it says, I'm logged into AWS. Says, I'm not logged into AWS. I'm going to click log out. Um, so that's great. But again, it requires the provider to actually create that opportunity for their customer. Um, and then the, the other nice thing about this is it can be used on almost any website, right? Um, when we get to the OAuth piece, the biggest limitation is if you look at all of the websites on the internet, how many of them actually support OAuth? If we're in the B2B world and we're focusing just on, oh, I want, um, I want Datadog, I want GitLab, I want all of these like commercial enterprises, absolutely there's OAuth because it's a thing that we've been hounding vendors about for the last, I don't know, 20 years. But there's a benefit there and that is if they do it, they get our business. Whereas if you're a local mechanic shop and you just want people to book spots uh, online with you, you're not incentivized to invest in OAuth. And so how do we support the general consumer uh, with a technology that doesn't exist everywhere? The other thing uh, that I think sort of makes OAuth tricky in situations like this is you have to configure it for each site. And so if there are 100 million sites on the internet and I hire a 10x engineer who can knock out one integration every six hours, okay, so that's 600 million. Did I say 100 million sites? I don't know. Um, but the, the point is it's a very, very long time to actually be able to reach the entire internet. Um, so we've done our pros and cons. Let's put them on a graph. Uh, that graph saying uh, low effort to high effort. Obviously, the business likes it whenever we do things low effort. Um, not secure to more secure. Obviously, as professionals, we like to be over there on the far right-hand side. So we look at this graph and we say, you know what? There's just so much risk with username and password. That's out. And then we go to our CTO and we say, hey, I want to do OAuth to the world. We're going to call get token every time we need this. And I tell them it's going to take a thousand years to get all of the sites that they want to cover done. And I get told, no, you know what? That's probably not. And even as a practitioner, right? I realize that if I try to make the world's most secure company, that's just us not making money with all the computers turned off. And I, I like having a place to work. I like building cool things for consumers. And so working with cookies for now is kind of like the way that I see us going. So uh, let's talk about that user context, uh, that authentication information. Uh, so there's sort of like the naive way, right, where um, you can just do it, make it work, it's going to work great. Uh, and then there's more of a more secure way. So first, let's talk about the naive way. Uh, so the first thing that I'll do is recognize, oh, the user wants to store a cookie. I'll create context. Uh, the intention controller is going to recognize that and say, oh, they want to store a cookie, cool. Uh, it's going to create a context container. That container exists purely to, uh, to, to allow the user to store those cookies. So um, some companies do it in a web browser. Some companies do it with a uh, Chrome extension. Um, lots of different ways that you could do it. But the point is we're going to collect that context. We're going to write it into a database. Uh, whenever it comes time to use that cookie, again, it all fits on one slide. Uh, I recognize I want to use this context. I say, oh, this is Matt's user account. I'm going to go ahead and go into the database, grab Matt's cookie, uh, and then stuff it into an actuator. That actuator now has a login session for me, uh, and it can order the thing that I asked for. Uh, it goes off into the third party space and does the thing it's supposed to do. What's the problem with this? What makes you nervous? Stolen cookies. I heard that in the front. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to be the guy that has a database just full of cookies that other people can just come in and take from me. That would be really, really bad. So let's think about a way that we could do this a little bit more securely. So I'll, again, I'll recognize I want to create some context. I want to store that cookie. The intention controller is going to recognize that, very similar to before. Uh, it's going to create that, that web browser so that the customer can log in. Uh, but then notice we have a vault service down below. And so once that cookie is collected, 
instead of just stuffing it into a vault and then returning it to the database, what we're actually going to do is we're going to stuff it into the vault, but we're also going to add the identity of the customer it belongs to. And so when we get to the next slide, you'll see that we should actually say, hey, yes, I want this cookie. Also, Matt said I could have it two minutes ago. And so by having like a short lived JWT that the user provides with you, uh, provides to you, your life just gets a lot better. I can sleep a lot better at night knowing that I'm not storing cookies for 100,000 people. I'm storing things that I'm storing encrypted blobs and you would have to actually have a request from the user in order to go get that cookie. Uh, so when we get to uh, using the context securely, I kind of already covered this, but we'll walk through it again. Um, we recognize the user wants to take an authenticated action. We get the object ID and not the actual object from the database. We send that object ID uh, and the user's JWT to our vault, uh, or sorry, to our context actuator. The context actuator now uh, is the thing that reaches out to the vault and gets that cookie. And so this one tiny space in our network is the only place that with uh, a request from the customer, you can actually go get their cookie. Um, once, once the actuator performs the action, we tear it down. We never use it again. It was just that one thing. And so the risk of someone coming in and stealing a token off of the, uh, the actuator gets a lot smaller, right? Essentially, we're looking at uh, build system compromises that allow you to get in versus earlier it was just, can someone access my database? So it was a lot um, as far as securing the customer context. Uh, so some do's and don'ts to sort of take away. Uh, don't collect context that'll make you a target. Um, if you are only storing uh, cookies for DoorDash, Spotify, and Uber, not a lot of people are gonna come after you, right? Like, like, why do I want this cookie that is likely going to get caught? There's much better things for me to spend my time on as an attacker. So uh, if we ever get to a world where somebody wants to use their AI walkie-talkie to spend money, uh, I don't want to store that financial instrument because that makes me a target. Um, and so allowing, allowing vendors um, service providers to actually own that piece is super, super important to me. Uh, the second piece uh, is don't reuse context or, uh, or yeah, context containers or actuators across users. So anytime I'm taking something sensitive from the customer, it should be a one-off thing. And then when it's done, it should go away. And then I don't ever have to worry about, oh, well, I accidentally ordered a thousand dollars worth of tacos on Jay's Uber Eats account instead of on Matt's, and now Jay has a ton of tacos to share with who? I don't, I don't know. Um, so not doing those. Uh, and then the, the other don't, big don't, is don't trust that context as being true, right? Um, it's really easy for, for our engineers and developers to think, oh yeah, no, this is a cookie that the customer gave us to order for them. So that's good, right? No, the answer is no. This is data that came from the internet and we should just treat it like all the other data that came from the internet. Uh, a couple of do's. Um, allow list vault access uh, to only the th that one thing that actually needs to go get it. Uh, this way, if you, do, um, if you do have any issues with people trying or having the ability to, to connect to your vault service, they can't actually do anything, right? Because you have to be running in that one specific container in order to, to access those tokens. Uh, and then uh, the last piece, which is kind of my favorite, uh, is correlation IDs. So anytime I need to ask for a uh, cookie from the vault, I should be able to match that up to a request that came from a physical device. And if I can't, that means that somebody that I work with is going to have a bad day or I'm going to have a bad day because somebody else is creating those requests. And so I think that's a thing that we sort of owe to our customers when we build devices like this is a way to tell them not only are we doing our best to protect your authentication information from random people on the Internet, but we also recognize your data is important to you. We are not you, so we shouldn't have access to it either. And so by, by, by introducing those correlation IDs, um, 
you can do really cool things like requiring that correlation ID to exist before the request gets routed into the vault, or you can just set up automated alerting so that you know if it ever happens, um, you, you at least know about it. Um, so do's and don'ts for context. Uh, so the next piece, securing customer conversations. Uh, this one was really, really fun to think about. Um, so if I take out my AI walkie talkie, and I say, what's my favorite color? Uh, there's a couple of types of data that happen there, right? We still have our, our same uh, speech to text request and response. We still have the LLM request and response uh, and the, the text to speech uh, back as well. So essentially, uh, I have audio data and I have text data that I need to worry about. Uh, as far as what type of binary data, it might be an audio recording, but it also might be a picture. Right? Maybe your, your magic AI walkie-talkie takes magic photos, and when it takes the photo, it converts it into like some cool 8-bit format. Um, I probably don't want random people on the internet or even the company that makes that AI walkie-talkie to have access to those pictures, right? Because I'm a general consumer. Why do people need access to that? Um, same thing goes with, with all of the, the text-to-speech that we just talked about. Right? We have a transcript of what the user said. We have an answer to their question, uh, and we have what we want the device to, to echo back. So how do we store that? Well, a uh, really, really easy way uh, is I have my Magic AI gadget. It sends a request uh, to that super awesome router uh, that will take everything that I wrote and then just store it in a database. If it's binary data, it'll just store it in S3. Um, in the database, I just put a pointer to S3. Life's great, this is super easy, right? Uh, again, we're storing sensitive things about people in a database. I don't wanna be like going to sleep at night knowing that that happens. So what do we do to make life a little bit safer? Uh, so instead of just receiving that data from the, the, the magical device uh, and then writing it all down, Again, we'll do the same thing uh, with, with our Vault engine. And so uh, whenever we receive the data, we'll actually uh, reach out to the Vault engine and say, can I have, uh, we've kind of got two really cool options here. So you could have the, the service send that data to the Vault engine, have it encrypt it, and then return back to you the, the ciphertext. And now you can just write that now in the future, you just have to take that ciphertext and say, Vault Engine, can you give me this data in plain text, please? Uh, the other option that you have is you can request the customer's uh, storage key, and you can say, please give me the key for Matt Domco. I have a bunch of stuff I want to write. In, in both cases, uh, I'm not storing things that I have access to. I'm storing things that I only have access to for that two-minute window whenever uh, Matt Domco pushes the button. Uh, so I've got some do's and don'ts for securing those conversations. Um, so don't, please don't use built-in types for these things, right? The, my worst day ever uh, is whenever someone says, oh yeah, no, we're just sending this JSON and there's just like a string there and I look at it, I'm like, oh, okay, cool, it's just a string, no big deal. And that string is actually like six hours of me uh, watching Gilmore Girls because I started a meeting transcription during it. Um, so rather than taking these things and just going with the defaults, let's create a custom object, uh, use a strongly typed language that allows you to say, okay, this, this is actually a type of sensitive data. And the only way that it's allowed to be logged is either through that um, vault controller interaction or through a secure logger. Um, so yeah, don't, please, one second. So uh, the other thing that definitely in the business to business space, it happens and it's not great, but it could be worse, right? Essentially, um, if I need to do analytics on data and I have the data in a place, well, let me just go grab that data and do analytics. It's one thing to do it whenever it's how many times uh, did my employees click on a phishing link? Uh, it's another thing altogether uh, for it to be uh, a recording of me and my kid talking about something. Um, so don't let it happen, right? Don't don't share uh, data between production and 
anything else. If you're not using that data to provide a direct value to the user, you're essentially stealing their data right now. And I'm not a fan. Um, and then the last one, uh, don't allow new log types without a privacy and security review. And so this is a thing that I've sort of started harping on a lot more at work, which is, which is like, if, if you want to do something new and it has to do with customer data, we owe it to our customers to spend 15 minutes drawing out what we're going to do, identifying the data that we're going to write down and talking about whether or not that is a good thing to do with our customer's data. Um, so yeah, don't do that. Uh, do move encryption to client side where possible. So the way that it is in this diagram that I just showed you, as the service provider, you can just grab a JWT and go get the data. Wouldn't it be great if the only person that had your data was like you in your web browser when you get to go view your pictures? That would be great. That's a technology that exists. Um, it's not a technology that exists as far as I'm aware that works really well with AI use cases where we want to get your permission to use your data to make things better. Um, and so that's, that's a tough, it's a tough road to climb, but I think, I think that there's, it's, it's a goal to move towards. Um, require a short-lived JWT. Like this is, it's really, really easy to do. You just, when your user wants to do something, make them send you a token that says that they want to do it and have that expire quickly. Uh, if you look into the different types of vault providers that exist, um, I know of at least one that, that does that and you can give them a JWT and they will only give you the data back if that JWT is signed by the customer, the person who owns the data. Um, I sleep a lot better at night knowing that I have that. Uh, and then the last piece, if you've ever worked at an AI company, you probably have like a chat room where it's just AI news and people are excited about new models and new things that are coming out and Anthropic has this, AWS has this, OpenAI has this, and they wanna try it out. The problem is, unless you have like a, like a commercial agreement with them, a lot of times uh, you're just sort of giving them free reign to do whatever they want with your customer data. And so one of the things that, uh, that I've worked really hard on at the last few jobs has been making sure that we, we actually make those thoughtful decisions. We say, okay, this type of data, maybe we're okay with, with that company using it for whatever they want. But this other type of data, super, super important to us and we're not gonna allow it to, to go to those levels of LLMs. Essentially pay more to protect our customers. I think it's worth it. Uh, so the last one uh, is privacy focused logging. Uh, so if you're an engineer and you're coming up with logs for this new service you built, uh, this is probably how you're going to do your logs. You're just going to take everything that you know and you're like, I might need this someday, ship it to Datadog. Uh, and then one of your SRE managers is going to be like, hey, so your Datadog bill is kind of high. Can you cut it back? And you're like, no, I need all of this. I need every single piece of data that comes in or I can't do my job. Okay, that's, that's a way. But again, we're talking about consumers. We're not talking about um, business to business operations. And so if I'm a consumer uh, and, and I have to worry about um, every single thing being stored on my behalf, I start to get nervous. And so what I like to do in these cases uh, is require like a custom logging handler. Engineers are already creating these to make their lives easier. All you have to do as the security person is say, hey, so right now it looks like you're taking everything, you're formatting it, and then you're, you're shipping it out. What I would love for you to do is instead explicitly declare these are the, the fields that we're going to log. And by forcing them to explicitly declare the fields that they're going to log, you don't have to worry about, oh, I just updated the code to log this extra field. Uh, also, it's everyone's um, birthday and social security number. That's okay, right? Um, you don't have to worry about that because the logger won't allow it. And now instead of monitoring your entire code base for a change that might log something in, the, in a wrong way, you only have to monitor that, that base privacy logger. Uh, so it's definitely worth investment. Um, this code is from ChatGPT. Write me a privacy focused log handler in Python. Um, it might work. I don't, I don't know. Um, but the, the point is, it's like, it's not, 
super difficult and your engineers are likely already doing it anyway. Uh, so some, some highlights on privacy focused logging, uh, prefer metrics uh, over like actual counts and group by statements whenever you're, you're thinking about things. You don't need to log every single request in order to know how many requests happened, right? And so uh, if you don't need to store the data, don't. Um, a, a thing that I've been big about for a very long time has been the fact that business metrics and that type of work needs to be a feature request of the product. This is not something where, oh, I've got a really strong program manager. They're going to go into Datadog and create these dashboards that are going to tell them like what our most popular feature is. It's a very, very easy shortcut, but it's also a very, very easy, easy way to lose control of the way that you're managing the privacy of your customer data. And so rather than getting into that, when we do a, uh, like a, a product design uh, doc, right? Let's explicitly call out, I need these metrics. And now it's part of the product. You don't have to go look through logs because you've already decided I'm going to use counters instead. Um, engineering logs for engineering things. Uh, we talked about using custom logging classes. Um, anonymize where possible, pseudo anonymize everywhere else. So I might need to know which user I'm dealing with whenever I'm solving an engineering challenge. I don't need to know that user's email. I don't need to know that user's address. I don't need to know any of those things. I just need to be, to be able to say user one, two, three of a thousand. And so this is where when we do logging, rather than logging all of the information we have about that, that customer, let's just log uh, a pseudo anonymized user ID. It doesn't provide access to anything, but it lets us sort of work through the streams and track down when bugs happen. Um, set an extremely short time limit for your, your engineering logs. If you need something for longer than a week, two weeks, that should probably live somewhere else. Probably doesn't need to be in Datadog. Your CFO is going to thank you. Um, and so are your customers because you're not storing their personal data somewhere that you don't need to. Um, enforce just in time logging. So uh, I think one of the coolest and scariest things about uh, joining an engineering team at Facebook is like the first two days when they're like, oh yeah, and by the way, if you look at anyone that you work with data, we're gonna fire you. And I'm just like, I don't even wanna accidentally do that. You're paying me really well, I get free pizza. Like, why would I mess that up? And the way that they enforce that is, if you need access to something and you don't have it by default, you just go find the table and say, I would like access to this. I need it for this long, and this is my business purpose behind it. And as long as it's not like your ex-partner's uh, page, it'll just grant you access and log it. Um, and I feel like it's way better to have that than, oh yeah, just everybody in engineering has access to everything all the time. Uh, so that, that just-in-time access uh, gives us, again, a little bit more safety and a little bit better of a way to, to recognize when something's going off the rails. Uh, all of the do's and don'ts that we talked about in, in the other two sort of apply to privacy-focused logging as well. All right, the last one, uh, privacy-focused analytics. So if i am got a feature that's out there, it's doing great things, but I want to make it faster, but I don't understand what requests are happening, and so I need to like actually see these requests in order to make the product work better. Well, 18-year-old Matt Domko uh, goes into the routing engine and he just adds uh, a new branch of code for 2A that says, yeah, so anytime uh, somebody makes a request, I want you to go do the thing that you always do, but also log a copy of it to my analytics storage. Uh, and then once that table is super full or that bucket has all the data I need, I can go in and do some sort of analytics process on it. The problem with that is in order to solve whatever challenge I'm facing, again, I probably don't need to know the customer's name. I don't need to know all of the things that they did. I probably just need to know um, what's the length of their request and what time was it when they made the request. Well, whatever the thing is that I need, uh, it's probably not everything. So the way that, uh, the way that I've thought about handling this, um, 
we have our our new analytics logger. And again, we still insert it uh, into 2A, but instead of having it directly write data outside of my little nice fancy production bubble where data never leaves, I write it to a privacy filtering account. And so that privacy filtering account, whenever it receives new data, it reaches in and it says, oh, I'm expecting that Matt needs to know the locations of every failed Uber request. And so what that privacy filtering Lambda will do is it will just extract the location and the time that that had happened because I don't need to know anything else about that conversation or what's going on except for that one single line. So why would I allow myself to copy the entire thing out? So I create this process where in order to get data out of production, I ensure that it's anonymized. I ensure that I only have the data that I need. Once that data has been cleaned, we've ran it through uh, something like um, Amazon Macy to check for PII and things like that. Uh, then we'll go ahead and copy it from the privacy account into the analytics account. Analytics is already expensive. And so like this additional process that we're introducing in order to protect our customers is totally worth it. And so um, we've got uh, a, a summary of the, the things that, that have made my life easier in protecting uh, customers' privacy. Uh, the first thing, um, simple data classification guide. Uh, anyone that was ever in the military, they've got like those colors. And when you see colors, you're like, oh, this is sensitive. I shouldn't do anything wrong with this. Oh, this is green. I think I can do whatever I want with this, but let me check. Um, having some sort of simple guide where your engineers know uh, if data is labeled as red, that means it can't leave, leave prod. If data is labeled as yellow, it means it can go from prod into the privacy account into an analytics account. If data is labeled as green, it's on the website, so who cares? Um, but coming up with those shortcuts for your engineers is gonna make your life a lot easier. Um, build that culture of design reviews, show up to them. I know that our engineers build a lot of really cool stuff all the time, uh, and that means I'm gonna be at more meetings. But again, it's worth it. You're learning more about the product. You, you have a chance to actually step in and say, well, what is this data and why do you actually need to store it? or move it or read it. Um, so build that culture, show up to those things. Um, service control policies, so these exist. I know in AWS and Azure, does GCP have something like this where you can say, you're not allowed to break this rule no matter what, I don't care who you are? Yeah, okay. Um, and so set that up. If you have a production account where all of your day-to-day -day data exists, make it so that you can't mess it up. No data is allowed to leave production except for to go to this singular privacy account. Um, it works fairly well and it keeps you out of trouble when you're traveling or at a conference talking about privacy. Uh, the two-step filtering process that we talked about, I feel like that's the only way that we can truly ensure we're not accidentally moving data somewhere we shouldn't. Uh, and so think about how to implement something like that. Um, there's tons of services and all the different cloud providers that will parse your data and tell you yes or no, this can, this can go, uh, or this yes or no, this has sensitive data in it. Um, I just learned about, uh, S3 bucket filtering that I don't remember the exact name, but anyway, you can create a new, uh, S3, uh, access point. We'll go with that. You can create a new S3 access point and say, through this access point, you can only read filtered data, which kind of takes your hands away from having to do anything as long as you only let your developers read through that singular uh, access point. Uh, oh, yes, almost done. Uh, so a couple of guidelines that, that I've set with the teams that I've worked with in the past. Um, this, is, this is the one that you screenshot uh, and, and send to everyone. And it's really just four questions. Are you logging a new type of data? We should talk. Are you moving data outside of prod? We should talk. Are you connecting to prod databases? We should talk. Are you bringing in a new tool or vendor? We should talk. Um, I think 
like those are fairly easy to do in practice um and it's worth the extra time that that we have to invest that's it uh what time is it 442 i have time for questions if anybody has any if not i'm gonna get off the stage and chug chug a bunch of water oh uh contact page so uh hashtag cyber on the twitter um and if like you're worried about your rabbit r1 security at rabbit dot tech i don't that guy right there so cool well thank you everybody have a great con